It's about 15 minutes from our house and we just wanted to greet you from here today. And we miss you guys so much, like more than you guys probably ever could know. So. Today's uh, our youth come up and they've prepared music, they're doing all sorts of things. Uh, and we even have some special visitors that'll join us on the screen that you might recognize in a little bit. I have very little to do today, which is great. Uh, the less you see of me and the more of the youth, the better. But I do want to remind you of a couple of quick announcements. Um, we have some exciting things coming up. Uh, to start with, Coffee Hour will be resuming in November. I know that's like half the reason we, yeah, yay. <laughs> the Lutheran in me is super happy about today. Yeah, just generally. Uh, I also want to share with you a little thoughts from our council. Our, our council works uh, just tirelessly behind the scenes. They do all sorts of things. Um, they uh, are, have been working, it's been wonderful to work with with me as we've been continually trying to improve the sound here. It is a work in progress. We've made a lot of headway in the sound. There's more stuff coming and uh, boy, it would sure be hard without a lot of the support that we get from the council. Um, they pray regularly with Pastor Jeff over the direction of the church and how to manage the church in this era, and in any era, but especially right now. Uh, and uh, we're pretty excited to announce that they've made the decision that starting next week, uh, they will no we will no longer require masks while you're seated. We'll just have the masks while you're moving around. The yeah, yeah, that's great. We said uh, everybody would probably give a big sigh of relief, which is actually the opposite of what you should do. <laughs> uh -huh. But... Yeah, so once you kind of basically the, uh, the, the guideline will be if you're moving around the building, mask up. Once you find your place and are stationary, you may unmask starting next week. I did want to address a little bit. There were some questions uh, really quick, so I don't want to take up too much time. Questions about the choir performance last week. And I must say, it felt really, really good to sing for you all again. It had, had been almost two years, and it was just a wonderful blessing to be able to sing again. There were some questions that were brought up about why the choir is in masks, and I wanted to explain that, uh, why we have our vocalists not in masks, but the choir must be. Um, as uh, being in the choral field, I have, uh, since the pandemic started, and, and actually here in Washington State, we were kind of ground zero for some of the problems with choral music and virus spread. Uh, a colleague of mine in Mount Vernon ended up being a CDC case study, and it was a really unfortunate event. So I've followed very, 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 very closely. I really try hard to uh, follow what the best practices are and not any particular sort of opinion here or there. Right now, it is still not responsible to do choral singing, to do big group singing on a stage unmasked. Um, and it's about reduction in percentages, not completely safe, because I understand people say, well, it's not 100%. That is absolutely true. It is not, there's nothing that is 100%. Um, but it's about reducing percentages of risk to within uh, what we feel are acceptable levels. Um, this is not going to continue forever. Um, it really is. We really are making some great headway, and, I, and you will not have the choir masked forever. It just won't happen. And we've got some other exciting things. We are moving forward to the point that I'm really excited to announce uh, the Sonora Christmas concert will happen. It will be an in-person event. So we are moving forward. We're all tired of COVID. We're all tired of masks, and they will go away. But that's, that's why for at least a little while longer, uh, the choir will stay masked up. Um, other than that, the only other announcements I have, again, if you want to uh, volunteer for the... Um, Compassion Closet, that is going. Gangbusters is doing really, really well. Uh, please reach out to the office and, and we can get you signed up for that. Uh, on that note, as I mentioned, we have some special guests uh, that we have flown in digitally 
from England who are going to give uh, contribute this morning as well. You might recognize the Barber family. Uh, welcome to Stanford, England. It's about 15 minutes from our house, and we just wanted to greet you from here today. And we miss you guys so much, like more than you guys probably ever could know. So. Today's call to worship is found in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in.
Good morning. Good, morning. Good morning. At this time, I'd like to invite all of our kids for Kids Town to come on up and join me on stage. We're going to do something a little different today, so come on over here, Daniel. Lily, would you like to join us? Anyone else from five years to fifth grade are welcome to join us. I have a little something I'd like to share with you this morning. You can just sit here by Daniel if you want. We're going to have a seat on the stage, okay? Ready? 
Come on. Y'all are younger than me. I just turned 39 years old and I got down on the ground quicker than you guys. Come on. Come on, guys. All right. <coughs> Today is a special day. You probably know it's Halloween, right? October 31st. But in church history, this is a very important day because on October 31st was the Reformation of the church. And it's what we believe today, and we hold it as truth today. So this is how it happened. In Europe, in the 16th century, there was a big change in Christianity. So people started teaching that you could pay money to go to heaven. Do you think you can pay money to go to heaven? Do you think that you can, you can pay to have a relative who passed away to get to heaven? You think you can just take money out of your wallet and then go to heaven? No, that's ludicrous. And so the, the religious leaders of that day were teaching that. Like, if you give us money, we'll make sure your, your family goes to heaven. Well, that's a lie, right? So the re religious leaders were telling people these lies. And so these godly men said, hey, that's not right. Let's look at this, okay? Okay, so they came up with these five things that we hold to be true, okay? And I'm going to teach you some Latin today. Have you ever heard of Latin? It's a language that is rarely used today, but a lot of our English words come from it, okay? So first, they're called the solas, and there's five of them, the five solas. Sola sounds like solo, like you're the only one singing. Well, these are the onlys of our faith, okay? Sola Scriptura. That means the Bible only. So we only trust the Bible to give us truth, okay? Only the Bible. Some men may teach you the Bible, but we got to make sure they're teaching right from the Bible, okay? Then we have Solus Christus. And that means Jesus Christ only. And that means that he is the only way to get to heaven. The only way you can go to heaven is by believing and trusting in Jesus and what he did on the cross and raising from the dead, right? <coughs> then we have sola gratia. And I apologize if I mispronounce any of this. I don't want any judgment from you. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> that means grace alone. And that means that people can go to heaven even if they don't deserve it. There's people that they do really bad things in life, but then God changes their heart by God's grace. He allows them to go to heaven if they believe in Jesus Christ only. Then we have sola fide, which means faith only. So that means that you have to trust in Jesus and believe that he's the only way to go to heaven. Okay? So that means you don't just know it in your head, but you believe it deep in your heart and soul. And then we have, I'm so sorry. There we go. Now we have Soli Deo Gloria, which means we worship God only because he is wonderful. And this means that God is the only one that people should worship. We know that, right? You don't worship anyone but God. You don't worship a person or a celebrity or your favorite, you know, TV personality, none of that. So we should not worship any man on earth or anything on earth. We worship God alone. And we don't have to trust in the church to go to heaven. We don't have to trust in people to go to heaven. We only trust in God and Jesus to go to heaven. So that's what we're celebrating today on Reformation Sunday. And I want you to remember that every October 31st, okay? Promise? High five. High five. Thank you, my lovely assistant. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and pray for these little ones. <clears throat> Let us pray. God, thank you so much for what you did for us in the, the Protestant Reformation. That you allowed these men to search the scriptures and find the truth so we can have them even today. I pray that we would never forget that you are the only way and that we would trust in you with all our heart. And I pray as these children go downstairs to learn their their Bible story, that you would just invade their lives and hearts, and that they would love you more than anything on this earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. 
we'll be glad to take this thing off here in just one second. All right. And then what'd you say, Jeremy? <laughs> Is that... It's okay if there's just one, right? <laughs> I love Youth Sunday. I've just got to tell you, I'm always encouraged every time we have a Youth Sunday. It's fantastic to see what our young people are capable of. Uh, they are the church of tomorrow, amen? And, and, and these are the young uh, men and women that are going to be absolutely leading the charge for the cause of Christ in the years to come. And so we want to do everything we can to support them, everything we can to build them up, give them opportunities to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, kind of serve and, and, and uh, sort of get some of, those, some of those training wheels under them, right? Or, or get the training wheels off, uh, so to speak. Um, you know, getting out there and realizing what they are capable of because they are capable of great things because God does great things through them. Amen. Well, we're going to continue today um, hearing from the Apostle Paul in Acts 26. If you recall, he had begun his discourse between Agrippa, uh, or before Agrippa, I should say. Um, this is, again, not a trial. This is sort of a hearing. Um, so when we look at this text, it's important for us to, to recognize what is uh, happening there. Um, just before I go any further than that, one thing I did kind of notice that I thought was kind of funny um, I don't think it was intentional, but it felt like little Daniel was kind of like hiding behind the pulpit a little bit. And I relate to that, right? Like, <laughs> it gets harder as you get taller. But I can understand that. And on uh, this, this over this weekend, you know, Ken uh, got together some people and they were doing sort of a packing party. There were a few others there that were helping him. Thank you for those that came and, and supported the endeavor of the work that we're doing with uh, Operation Christmas Child. Uh, we decided to start putting them out in front. We want to, to really celebrate every victory, every one of these boxes is something worthy to celebrate. And our goal this year is 80. And so I want to kind of encourage you a little more. As we get more and more boxes, you have to see less and less of me um, because they get higher and higher. So if that's the incentive you need, we're going to go with that. Whatever it takes, um, I want to encourage you to be a part of what God is doing through these boxes. The shoebox ministry is always just fantastic. Um, it's, it's an outreach that maybe we will never know the full extent of what we do. And, and sometimes that's difficult, right? We don't we don't always trust things that we can't see the outcome, but I want to promise you that there will be a return waiting in heaven um, for these, these things that you do. Um, so again, I want to encourage you to be part of that and just stack them high, stack them high. We're shooting for 80 this year, um, so there's still time left. Let's make that happen. Um, okay, so we're continuing in Acts 26. We're going to be beginning in verse 12. So if you've made your way there, let's go ahead and read together. Uh, we read before... Um, it was Festus speaking, right? And so last week was a little odd because we were, we were kind of talking about the words of Festus almost. And, you know, he was not even a believer. So what can we do with the words of a non-believer? Well, we found there was quite a lot that we could actually take from that. That God uses both believers and non-believers alike for his purposes, for his glory. And here we have the opportunity um, to kind of pick up where uh, Paul um, has, has kind of begun. Um, so if we recall... Um, the last that we had heard, um, I'm just going to go back just a hair just to, to see. Um, Paul was talking about the things that he had done, right? He was talking about how he had gone out, he had persecuted um, the Christians, and he was uh, it, on his way, right, to go and, and do more persecution when this happens. I bring that up just because the beginning of this text uh, begins in this connection, right? And so unless we have some context of what came before it, that's a little odd transition. Would you join me as we read? Beginning of verse 12. In this connection, <clears throat> I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven. Brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? For I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a, as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient in the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus 
then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day, I have had the help that comes from God. And so I stand here testifying both to small and to great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you're out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words, for the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly, for I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice. For this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. Then the king rose, and the governor and Bernice, and those who were sitting with them. And when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, This man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Would you join me in asking the Lord to bless the reading, the hearing, the teaching, and the application of his word? Heavenly Father, we just thank you once more. For all that you have done so far today, Lord, I thank you for these young people. I thank you for the blessing uh, that we have in watching them grow, watching them develop into the young men and women of God that you have called them to be. Lord, I pray that you would help us as a church to come alongside them, to encourage them, uh, to guide them in the way that they should go, to follow your lead in all things in this life. And Lord, we just pray that as we step forward through your word, uh, Lord, that we would truly uh, lean on the authority of scripture alone. There are many, many voices in this world, and Lord, we want to listen to yours alone. And so we just pray, uh, Lord, that you would reveal something new to us here today from your text, that your Holy Spirit would give us wisdom and understanding, that he would give us unity, Lord, that we would be edified by all that we say and do here at this time. And we ask all of these things in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So that's a little bit of a chunk of text. I understand that. There are some of you who are kind of like, okay, we, we cutting it off? No. No? Okay, okay. It's a, it's a big chunk, but we're going to walk through this. There's a lot of things happening here. Right? Paul, again, we see him go straight into that testimony portion. We've talked about testimonies over and over and over and over again because testimonies, again, are the most powerful tool that you have in your witness. It is your story. It cannot be refuted. It cannot uh, be be cast aside. It cannot be ignored. You have walked that road. You have lived that truth. And so there is no story in your life that you can tell with such conviction as your own testimony. When we begin to speak from just rote memorization or anything of that nature, we begin to question, do I have this right? But when we speak from our own experiences, at least until several years have passed, we pretty well have a good understanding of what happened. After a few years, the details get a little fuzzy and we start to fill in the blanks. But that's a different thing altogether. Our testimony, however, I think we don't have that issue with. I think we remember every moment of what happened. When we came to the realization that we were a sinner in need of a Savior, when we were confronted with the truth of our Savior and we receive His salvation, I don't think that memory ever fades. We can forget a great many things in life, but that one I think remains. So, as I mentioned before, our text begins with the, in this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and the commission of the chief priests. Again, Paul is, is uh, addressing the room here, right? He has, he has the, uh, the Jewish zealots that have come to have him killed yet again. Paul is getting quite used to this uh, at this point. Uh, and so he is sort of addressing them. He's saying, look, I, I, was, I was doing all the things that you wanted me to do. He's going he's gonna to continue this, so we're not going to stay on this too long. He actually comes back to the same point. But he's saying, look, I was doing exactly what they told me to do. It was by their command that I was going to Damascus. But then something happened. See, this is the beautiful part of the testimony that we we miss far too often. What is that something that happened? 
You know, we've talked before about how we like to leave off our road to Damascus. We don't like to talk about the things that were getting us into trouble. We don't like to talk about the sins that were occurring in our life that were dragging us down, leading us into darkness, as Paul says in here. But then something happened. God happened. Jesus happened. And so this is Paul's explanation of this. He says, at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Now there's a few things in here. First thing I want to point out, You know, he mentions it was at midday, right? Midday, as we well know, the sun is at its highest, it's at its brightest. This is the the most fierce that the the sun will ever be throughout the course of the day. After that, it starts to wane. That's an important comparison to make because he says even in spite of the brightest that our sun could be, the Lord shone brighter. It's not a huge theological point there, but I think it's important for us to note. No matter what this world has to offer, no matter how bright it may appear, the Lord shines brighter. I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Paul is very clearly identifying this as the God of the Jews. Again, he's speaking to uh, a, a room that is mixed. There, there's going to be you know, Jews there, there are going to be Romans there. Uh, there may have been any number of other uh, particular faith groups you know, represented there or cultures represented there. To simply identify it as God or a God leaves it open to interpretation. Specifying that God spoke to him in the Hebrew language identifies this voice as the God of the Jews. And he addresses him. By his Hebrew name, if you recall, we've talked about that before. Paul and Saul, Paul didn't change his name, right? That, that, that happens in the Old Testament a couple of times. There were, there were specific name changes. Paul didn't change his name. Paul had two names. He had a Hebrew name and he had a Roman name. Um, and so Saul was his Hebrew Jewish name, and that is the one he used uh, by and large for most things. But when he began his ministry to the Gentiles, he began to primarily use his Roman name. I will use my Gentile name when I am dealing with the Gentiles. So he was kind of taking on that mantle. Um, but again, he is being addressed by his, uh, his Hebrew name. And he makes this statement. He asks, you know, why are you persecuting me, right? Why are you doing this? And he says, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. Now, if, if you are not familiar, a goad is an implement that is used to lead and direct animals. You may have heard the, the expression that someone is goading you on, right? That's, that's how that works, right? If you were trying to steer, whether it be you know, cattle or oxen or whatever it may be, there would be an implement that is used to, to sort of get them to go in one direction or another. And what this is talking about here, this expression is talking about the futility of that animal kicking against that, right? So, so you have, uh, you know, say an ox pulling a, a wagon or something of that nature, and you are trying to sort of steer that ox. Well, if the ox wants to kind of do this, it doesn't really do anything, does it? No, you're still stuck to the wagon. You're just kind of doing that number, right? And this is what Paul was doing, <coughs> You see, God is trying to say, look, I'm, I'm trying to take you from being over here to being over here. I'm trying to lead you in the way that I need you to go. And Paul's too busy going, I'm busy. Not now. <laughs> Just recognizing the illustration I was going to use here about the futility of what it means to kick against what's going to happen. Um, we recently had to clip the nails of the pugs. And in doing so, you have to wrap them around. It's a two-person job, just in case you didn't know. You have to wrap them in a blanket, and you have to hold them. And the worst is dear little Charlotte. I'm going to talk about Charlotte, because, again, she's my favorite. And I can say that because the pugs don't watch these sermons, and they won't know. But she doesn't like getting her nails done. And, uh, yeah, she'll, she'll fight it. She'll, she'll yelp. She'll move around. But it's futile, right? This has to happen. We have to trim these things. This has to be done. There's a sense of futility in that. And sometimes we find ourselves in the same sort of way, rebelling against God. Just like little Charlotte, wrapped up in that little towel, right? Just squirming all over the place. 
That's what happens when God is saying, look, this is what I need you to do. This is what is good for you. This is what is right for you. And one way or another, this is going to happen. Your parents probably told you that on many occasions, right? If we can do this the easy way or the hard way. And what do we do as kids? We said the hard way, right? Yeah, yeah, I heard it. <laughs> Sounds like that may be a, a sore spot still for some. <laughs> but how did that go when you went the hard way? It just took longer to get it done, didn't it? And sometimes you had to go further. You had to do more things. You know, if it's like, well, chores have to get done. Well, I'm not going to do them. Well, very well, now you have more chores. Well, that didn't go as planned. That wasn't what I was doing. I was kicking. You didn't get my kick. I was trying to rebel against what was happening. Eventually, what has to happen is going to happen. And what we see in this is we see a beautiful example of God's permissive and his prescriptive will. I don't know that we ever think about that, but there are, there are two wills of God, a permissive and a prescriptive will. What can happen and what must happen. And there are times in which both of those have room to occur, and we need to recognize what is what. God has determined our end states, but we have been given the freedom to determine how we get there. Can we recognize that? God in his sovereignty has determined our end states. To, to, to go in any other route denies him his sovereignty. He is sovereign. He has determined our end point. But we have been given choice and will to determine how we get there. And sometimes we take the direct path that is easy, and sometimes we like to take the winding road that is broken and takes forever. And there is pain in the process. We have choices to make in all things. You see, we can choose to live lives that bear eternal fruit over the course of our entire life, right? We can do things that are going to bear eternal fruit, or we can waste them and have absolutely nothing to show for the time that we have been given on this other side of glory. We've talked about that second judgment, right? There's a time in which it, this isn't whether or not you get in. This is once you're already in, your life will be laid before you and set on fire. Right? It will be, it will be tr tested by flame. And the things in our life that have been for the glory of God will endure. And the things in our life that were for our glory will all go up in smoke. And we will know right then and there how much of the precious time that we were given. Because you only get one run through this. Right? Life is precious. Every moment that we have is precious. And we were going to see how much of that was spent on the things that matter. And how much of that was squandered away. And I have every confidence that if we could feel an ounce of sorrow in heaven, I think we'd feel it in that moment when we realize just how much of our lives we have squandered away for selfish gain. And we can spend our lives following God's leadership, or as we said, we can spend our lives rebelling against him at every turn, choosing our own paths and, and sort of trying to pave our own way and just wandering. You know, wandering was actually one of the, the first things that ever happened as soon as we departed from God's will. We're all familiar with Cain and Abel, right? Well, when Cain fled to the land of Nod, the word Nod means wandering. We began our wandering right there at the beginning. As soon as we step outside of the will of God, as soon as we step outside of God's plan, we find ourselves wandering. In our own wisdom, in our own uh, foresight, we think, hey, I have a plan. I know exactly where I'm going. Who has ever had a plan go exactly as planned? Our plans don't do that. We have suggestions. We have hopes. We have dreams. We have good ideas, and we can put all manner of proper planning in place, but they never go exactly as we have planned. But God's always do. You can see time and time again, and when God says this must happen in the scriptures, it is going to happen. We may not realize the how or the why. We may be surprised at how it comes to pass, but it will happen because God has made it so. That's why we're not God. 
Amen? Because our plans fall through. His always succeed. Let's continue on. Verse 15. Paul gives his response. It says, then I said, who are you, Lord? He recognizes immediately the Lord. And the Lord says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet. For I have appeared to you in this purpose, to anoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me, and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that may, they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Again, immediately, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. He immediately recognizes the lordship of the voice that is speaking to him, but he doesn't know who he is speaking to. He says, who is it? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. There's a twofold part in this message. One, it solidifies Maybe not to the rose in the rest of the room, but it solidifies absolutely to Paul. The lordship of Jesus. He had no doubt at that point in time. I, and there are times in which I wish we all had that dramatic Damascus Road kind of experience because I don't think we would falter in our faith as much as we do if we had a direct encounter with God. But again, we are not apostles, and so we, we, we make do with what we have. But he had no doubt None whatsoever. He heard the voice. He saw what he saw, and he knew that this was the voice of Jesus. But again, he is, he is bringing in the rest of the room. He's sort of nodding in agreement with the Jews, saying, look, even God recognized that I was doing exactly what they told me to do. I was persecuting those of the way. I was persecuting the believers. I was doing exactly the same thing that they were. We were all in agreement at that point in time. But God, God himself, Jesus, in this case, speaking specifically, says, what are you doing? Why are you persecuting me? Tells him that he is called to be a witness to the things he has seen and the things he will see. I want us to stop right there for a moment, just really kind of, Think on that one. How many times do we find ourselves thinking that our witness is to go and to share the scriptures? Now, understand me here. I'm not. I'm not saying that the scriptures are bad and that we shouldn't use the scriptures. Right? The scriptures are 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 absolutely our resource and are useful for every good work that we have. Right? But what I'm saying is, if your idea of your ministry is to go around and share Bible verses, you are missing out on the most powerful gifts that you have been given. You have been given the opportunity to testify, right? Because that's what a witness does, right? A witness testifies to what you have seen. If all we are doing is coming and bringing information, if all we are doing is coming and bringing knowledge, what we are not bringing is experience. What we are not doing is saying, look, I not only believe this, I have experienced this. I have lived this. I have seen God in my life work in miraculous ways, and I want to tell you all about it. Because if you haven't experienced God for yourself, why should I care? I can get information from just about anywhere. I've got all kinds of people sending me emails, and, and we get phone calls, and all kinds of media trying to teach us new things. It's information, and information, whether it's good or bad, you know, that that is a completely different thing altogether. But information is just that. It's information. But what are you doing with it? Simply knowing about God is not enough. In fact, we can look no further than the Pharisees to see that. Even Agrippa himself, right? We are standing, uh, Paul right now is standing in chains, of course, before Agrippa, who was regarded widely as a prominent Jewish academic, right? He knew these things. But simply knowing knowledge it's not the same as knowing Christ. And what Paul has been given the opportunity to do is to testify of things that he has seen, and God gives him this promise that he will continue to do more things. He says, you're going to talk about what you've already seen, and I'm going to give you more. 
When you run out of that, when you've told them that, I will fill your cup once more. I want to ask you this. If you feel that maybe, you know, you haven't seen God do something new in your life for a time, ask yourself, when's the last time I shared what he did? Does he still have mercies and and blessings that you have already received that you haven't given him credit for? Are there blessings that you have received that you have not been thankful for, that you have used as your testimony? Maybe he's holding back and saying, look, until you can handle that, I, I can't do anything more with this. You're squandering this blessing that I'm giving you. Let that one go. Let that go out into the world. Be a witness to what you have seen me do in your life, and I will do all the more. How wonderful is that thought? To know that God is not just simply a one and done Savior, that he doesn't just step into our life and bless us in one case and then walk away and leave us for the rest. Now he blesses us over and over and over again. And we have the opportunity to continually point back to him over and over and over again in all things. In just these few words here, uh, again, Paul, I really think he, he probably wrote some of this stuff out before he said it because it's just too good to just come off the cuff like this. Um, in the middle of all of this, he's also giving a very concise message of salvation. There are some pieces kind of messed, up, uh, missed, you know, from that, but, but he, he gives a very clear and concise message of salvation, because again, he was, he was speaking to Agrippa. He didn't have any, uh, maybe great expectations, but he had absolute hope that he might hear him and be changed. He tells them that you must turn from darkness to light, from Satan to God. He recognizes in that brief moment that there is a, a, a curse upon us, he kind of continues on, he says, receive forgiveness of sins. This way he identifies what the problem is, what has cast us into darkness. It is our sin. And that there is a cure for our sin. There is forgiveness from our sins. We must receive it from Jesus. And he tells us about the promise that is to come, that we would join the others who have been sanctified by faith. That there is a place where God has gathered up his people, where he has gathered up his believers, those who have been sanctified in him. Now in this, we actually see some of those things that Melinda was talking about earlier, right? It wouldn't be Reformation Sunday without addressing the solas, right? And we've, we've kind of talked about how there, there's sort of a linear progression in four out of five. Is that our salvation comes from who? Christ alone, right? This is a sola test, so you can feel free to use those, right? right? The solus Christus, right? Salvation comes from Christ alone. It is extended to us by what alone? Oh, got a little uh, Sunday school. No. Grace. Salvation is extended to us by grace alone. Alone, It is not something that is extended to us because we have earned it because of our works. It is given because of God's grace. It is all Him through and through. Because of His grace, He extends salvation to us. And we receive it by what? What's the other one? There we go. Yeah. Start crossing things off the list. It gets easier, right? You're like, it's not, it's not Bible. It's not Bible. <laughs> all right? So salvation is extended to us from Christ alone. By grace alone, it is received by faith alone, right? And there was a purpose for that, to give glory back to God. And this is exactly what we see Paul uh, talking about here, is that this is the charge he was given, to go and to proclaim the glory of God, because it is all for the glory of God alone. I mentioned there's a logical, there's a sort of a linear progression. It's actually more cyclical than linear, to be honest, because it sort of repeats, right? We receive salvation. We receive blessing from Christ alone. It comes to us by grace alone. It is received by faith alone for the purpose of giving God glory alone. And what happens is when we give God that glory that he is due, and we testify to the things that we have seen, we receive new blessing given by grace, received by faith to give more glory. That's the kind of feedback loop we like to have. 
sound booth back there going, don't say feedback loop, don't say feedback loop. <laughs> but that's the good one, right? Because it continues over and over and over, and with more glory comes more blessing. And we don't simply glorify God so that we would receive things. We don't do it for selfish ambition. We do it because he is worthy. And we know all of this is true because of Scripture alone, right? I don't, I'm not going to leave out the fifth one, but the fifth one is sort of the table that the other meals, if, if we were looking at the four courses of this, this wonderful feast, Scripture alone is sort of the table in which they stand upon. Continuing on, verse 19, Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient in, uh, to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, that th- and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day, I have had the help that comes from God. And so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. Again, Paul continues his appeal to Agrippa's knowledge, right? He's uh, he, he points out very uh, clearly in there, um, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, right? And he, he clarifies that, right? That, that Christ must suffer, and by being the first to rise from the dead, he will proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. These were things that were evident in the prophecies. And again, we see this uh, very clearly uh, later on as he, he continues uh, is speaking with, with Agrippa here. But again, he's pointing out, I did all of the same things that you did. I was just like you. I believed the same things that you did. We worshiped the same God. And when he spoke to me, this God that we all agree about, this, uh, this God that we all claim to serve and to seek, he spoke to me and I listened to him. And because I listened to him, you want to kill me. And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you're out of your mind. Or as Melinda said earlier, that's ludicrous. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true in rational words. Once again, we have a rational faith. But to the outside world, you notice it wasn't Agrippa saying this, it was Festus saying this. To the outside world, our faith appears like madness. Always has been, always will be. Let's just recognize that, okay? That's, that's how it is. It's just as true today as it ever has been. Our faith will continue to look like madness for those on the outside. And that's, that's not a knock on them. Right? That doesn't make them bad people. It means they don't understand. And it's our job to help them in that. It's our job to, again, testify to the things that we have seen. It is our job to proclaim the rational nature and the reasonable nature of our faith. Because we have a rational and a logical faith. Paul points back to Festus at this point. For the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly. For I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice. For this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. Again, he's saying, do you? You know. I know because of your great knowledge you can verify the things that I have told you. If I have said anything that is even remotely close to untrue, tell me now. Because if you can't tell me anything that has been said that is untrue, it must then be true. Right? I mean, that's the opposite. They can't. The words of the prophets were not up for debate. The words of the prophets were absolutely set in stone. Paul continues on. Agrippa says to Paul, In a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, Whether short or long, I would that you I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might because become such as I am, except for these chains. 
Then the king arose, and the governor and Bernice and those who were sitting with them, and when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, this man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Paul gives Agrippa one, one more chance. And we don't know, this may have been his last chance. And Agrippa says, would you convince me in such a short amount of time? Oh yeah, he would. Didn't take very long for Paul to be convinced. Took one experience on that road, right? Didn't take very long at all. But what we see here is we see a comparison between two freedoms. And this is the choice that we are going to have to leave with here today. You get to choose between one of two freedoms. See, Paul says, I wish that you were like me except for these chains. And Festus said, you know, if he had just simply kept his mouth shut, if he just simply went with the flow, if he just simply denied everything he had been told, if he just didn't talk about the blessings that he received, if he had done nothing in obedience with what Jesus is telling him, you know, Festus or Agrippa would have probably said, you know, what his God is telling him. But if he has done nothing in accordance with what God is telling him to do, that he could have been set free by all measure of men. God says, I'm here to talk about setting you free from the bondage of sin. I'm here to tell you what it takes to be set free. I may be in chains here in this earthly body, but I am free in eternity. And today we have to make our decision. Which type of freedom are we going to pursue are we going to pursue the earthly freedom that has us running away from the things of God, that has us ignoring the things of God, that has us kicking against the goads, doing our own thing in all futility, living a life that one day will burn before us and amount to nothing? You have the freedom to do that. Or are we willing to endure the chains. Now, Paul, Paul says, look, I wish that you had everything I have minus the chains. I actually wish that you had more blessing than I do. For Paul to say that to Agrippa, that's a pretty big thing. That's a very mature thing for him to say. How often do we think that? When we speak to people out in town, do we say, look, I wish more blessings on your life than I received in mine. I wish that you could have every measure of grace that I have received, and then some, none of the pain, none of the suffering, none of the persecution. Paul says, I wish you even better than what I had. But that freedom is from sin. That freedom is for eternity. We have a choice to make. Choose your freedom. Would you join me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this time. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to make that choice. Lord, you have given us free, and whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And so we rejoice in that freedom. But we know with that freedom, with that eternal freedom, Lord, it often comes at a price here on this earth. We have to choose one or the other. Lord, we choose you. And I pray that we could echo that, every single one of us, that we would say we choose you. Over the persecutions of this world, we choose the freedom that we have in you. We choose to follow your lead, not to rebel against you, not to, uh, to, to kick against the goads, Lord. We want to follow you in all that you tell us to do. Lord, we want to live lives that amount to something. Lives that have eternal worth, eternal significance. Lord, we want to live lives of proclaiming glory. Help us to be a witness. Help us to testify to the things that we have seen. Take nothing for granted. Hold nothing back. Keep nothing for ourselves. Lord, we want to give you that glory. And Lord, we just ask all of these things in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Join us in singing hymn 26, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. A mighty fortress. 
Just as cruel as may be, Christ Jesus, it is He, Lord, save our time, His name, from age to age the same, and He must Not yet. <laughs> uh, as we as prepare to sing hymn 602, so, uh, I want to encourage you as we leave today, really ask yourself, are there blessings that I have squandered to myself, blessings that I have received and perhaps buried in a hole and I'm hiding from the rest of this world? Is there glory that I am keeping back from the Lord? I want to encourage you. Let that be your testimony. To be a witness, to go out into this world, to share the things that God has done, the things that you have seen. My prayer is that he would continue to refill your cup over and over, that you would receive new blessings, that you might give back new glory. Would you join me as we pray once more? Heavenly Father, we just thank you again for this day that you have given us. We pray earnestly, Lord, that you would truly remind us of the things that we receive, that we might give back your glory. Lord, we receive so that we might give back freely. And Lord, you continue to pour out your blessings upon us. We don't know why, but you said you would. And so we trust it. We believe it. We know because Scripture says it is so. 
And so, Lord, we just pray that you would just be with us as we go. Give us boldness to open our mouths and to speak before those in this world. Proclaim your truth that you may be glorified in it. And we ask all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Church family, both here and afar, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Now, would you join